Good morning and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking a look at a hidden cash passive floor deck that I made for 10.3. Now this one combines a few different things. It has the poison package, it has tributes, and it has of course passive flora with the blind eyes and all that sort of thing. So we'll go through the deck list so you can understand why I put it together the way I did and then we'll go through the strategy so you understand how to play it. Now Passiflora is a scenario that progresses whenever we play a blind eye. So on the first chapter or prologue, we're going to be getting a Passiflora Peach. When we play our first blind eye, we're going to be getting six coins. And then when we play our second blind eye, we're going to be getting a Sly Seductress. So the Peach is this one here. It's going to be Horde 2 because of Leader. But at the end of the turn, it's going to boost self by one. And then the six coins, obviously, we can use however which way we want. And at the end here, we get the Sly Seductress being... A card that whenever your opponent plays a unit boosts self by one bonded whenever your opponent plays a card boosts self by one so we want to try and get these bonded we do have the means to do so with cards like adrian or the mink i didn't want to run a pair of them in the bronze end like you could and i've done this in the past but that's definitely something a bit different i find if i'm going to go for it i'm going to go all in and use mushy truffle and make it non-devotion but in this case i wanted to run a devotion deck and i felt like it's pretty good without making a sly seductress swarm the strategy Obviously, that's its own type of deck. This is a little bit different. So, uh, scenario plays quite well. We have to be somewhat disciplined with our scenario because we only have four playable blind eyes in the deck. So, we have the one here. We've got the two, the three, and the four. So, you don't want to be using too many of them early on. But I've developed a strategy for early game so that we don't have to right so we have really good cards i want to be taking tributes off the salamandra mage in round one because we want to get out king of beggars not necessarily at the end of the game right we want to take that for a thin we want to get the coins out early so we could respend them and just get like when we get our money back basically on things like sea jackal to take round one and we want to get out Cobb, preferably before we put down scenarios so that when we're profiting off scenario and um, you know, playing Adriana, we're not over profiting in that play. So that's basically why we want to take these early on. And I don't mind even going as far as Marils early on. So that when it comes to, you know, round three, we put down Jock, we get King of Beggars out right away, we put down Scenario, we start playing it that way, and we don't have to worry about over profiting in the round. So that's basically it. Now, Jock just feels like a good fit in the deck in round three it turns into Jacques Grandmaster So it has veil can't be locked. It's an active spender It does have the tribute for Cobb if we're desperate for that tribute value We do get the flaming rose footman So it's extra units on the board to poison to boost and of course um, Whenever we play a fire sworn card gain one coin has a bit of synergy with things like the disciples now That's obviously a little bit of an added bonus. That's not the reason why he's there It's mainly just the tribute and the spender that we have otherwise i'd be putting something in like professor i think in that spot now king of beggars just fits pretty well in the deck that now we don't have to put too much in the way of profit like you could see here we have the fist text for profit a couple cards gain a little bit of profit our leader gives us a few coins at the beginning of each round if we want to click it then but uh all in all we're not using too many profit cards which is why i felt like putting king of beggars in the deck fee one boost self by one while in deck Whenever you pay a tribute, remove a counter for each coin paid. For each removed counter, gain one coin back. When the counter reaches zero, summon self from the deck to a random allied row with a cooldown counter of 12. So yeah, basically 4, 8, and 12, right? That's kind of what I had in mind. You don't, like I said, want to take it necessarily off Adriano when you have Scenario on the board, but that's kind of the way to go about it with King of Beggars. I think it plays for a pretty good card in that, uh, in that case, but... If you're using it incorrectly, you're losing points. So you'll see situations in the video today where I was forced to use it a little bit awkwardly, but all in all, you kind of have to stick to the strategy and it works out pretty well. Now, Horse and Junior is really good right now with a lot of the swarm matchups going around. So deploy damage a boosted enemy unit by six, gain a coin for every point of access damage dealt, but we're devotion. So we have damage an enemy unit by six instead. With a fee of three, destroy an enemy with three less power. So if we're playing into like a Deadeye Ambush deck, you can imagine how we can just eliminate their swarm. If we're playing into Fire Sworn, the same thing applies, right? We can just go and chew through all of their tokens. And that's what makes this card valuable. And because I have something like this, and I have the Salamandra Mages, I didn't feel like it was necessary to run Tin Boy. 
I think if you're running Tin Boy as well at that point, you're not running some of the other options. So you have to use your discretion there. If I was running Tin Boy, maybe we take out Horse and maybe we make it non devotion. Maybe we put a Heat Wave. It's kind of one of those things. So I like it the way it is for the reason it is, but that's definitely an idea as well. And uh, Philippa's really good for those times where we have a lot of coin and we need to offload it. And obviously we want to take away a threat from their side of the board. So this is like a pseudo heat wave for me because anything that we're going to want to heat wave usually, unless it's really tall, we can just go and we can take with Philippa, right? Whether it's a defender, a Sigvald, any sort of uh, really game changing card. The best part about it though is it doesn't lock it like a muzzle does. So we can go ahead and use that card for ourselves afterwards. Right, spend the number of coins equal to the enemy unit's power, then seize it. So we have up to nine for a ceiling, being the maximum amount of coins that we can hold. And uh, we get some really good fill up a place today. You'll see one, I think, in the first game even. Valdi Banks, just a card for consistency. If I was going non devotion, I would put Royal Decree. Right? We don't always need, well, we can't see it here, but we don't always need the extra profit from it. But um, it is nice to have if we have to dig deep in the deck in round three and it's the beginning of the round. So that's something. Marils is a very flexible card. We can either damage a unit by four or we could take the tribute and destroy it instead. So this would be like our direct tall punish, right? This is kind of a tall punish. This could be a somewhat tall punish, but this is just like a real tall punish. So destroying a unit, it's fairly inexpensive to do so, right? Six coin, not too bad at all. Uh, Flying Redanian just makes sense. In this deck, it's going to be Horde 7 on end turn, summon unit from your deck to the graveyard or graveyard to the allied row. So you can imagine, like, we play a Fist Tech, click Leader, Boat comes out. We click our Stratagem, play something else like this, the Boat comes out, right? It's uh, really easy to get the Boat out with this Leader, and I like the synergy that it has there. The Adrian of the Mink is just something to help us get points on the board, take a tribute if we need it. It's a, a good point swing. It has the blind eye tag. That's basically it. So, tribute five, spawn a slice seductress in the row. The first clause, increase profit by one for each allied slice seductress, is not really applicable like as much in this deck because we're not swarming them, right? Like I said, that's just a, a completely different thing. But uh, we take it for the tribute, for the tag, for the the bonded ability that we can get with the scenario. And Gellart is actually really good in this deck so if you look at it this way we're getting the eternal fire disciples spawning tokens on the board these are going to be giving us two points for one coin every turn and then this is going to be giving us two points for one coin so we're basically getting four points per turn for two coins and we can just win a round off that alone which is why i say it's not always necessary to spend much else in the first round because we get these out we get boat out we're just in a really good spot right we have maybe a poison and maybe a jackal and we're done we got it most decks can't compete with that right maybe take mages if we have to we just want to round off browns as alone we could save all the golds for later and it gets kind of scary so that's kind of why gellert's in here i thought about putting Saul. And uh, I played a game with Saul, and it just didn't work out, right? Obviously, Horde 7 boosts out by 3 in turn. Seems like something you wouldn't want to miss, but I feel like it's just such an easy target. At least we make them work for a target. This is just giving them so much value. Even off something like a Spores, it just it feels really bad if we lose to that. And uh, which this is why I didn't put uh, Saul in the deck. I wanted to split our points up a bit wider. Just keep them a bit safer, right? Salamander Mages. Tribute 4, damage 3 adjacent units by 2. Whenever you pay a tribute ability, gain 1 coin. Adrenaline 5, gain 2 coins instead. So, again, try and play these early so we can get those big tributes out of the way. And, um, you know, just get them out in round 1. Maybe take a small tribute after. But we don't really want to be having both these on the board than taking really big tributes in round 3. Because... We're going to be over profiting, especially if it's scenario round. So that's why I like to split them up accordingly. The Raiders are just in there for the thin and to get more bodies on the playing field for the Gellert. So it just kind of makes sense. Horde 2 in this event, we just bring them out. Very simple to uh, to get that to work. We just have Fist Tech for profit and poison. The Trafficker for, again, profit or poison. So these are quite flexible for either engine removal or tall punish. The Renegade Mage is in place of the Apothecary, so I just wanted to have another Blind Eye Tag in there, like an inexpensive one, and I felt like this is 
kind of like the best value overall if i'm looking for the apothecary of course when i'm looking for something it's not here this one here this is not a bad card either right um it gives us the blind eye tag it gives us an extra tribute you can heal something and boost something so this could play for more points than the mage but i just felt like you know what with all the tokens going around why don't we just swap it out for the mage we get seven points every time we don't have to worry too much about it it's good it's better like in a short round especially if there's like three cards and they're playing into like a control matchup at least we could just play this and we get the points right away so that's kind of why i made the swap at the end that's really the only swap i made from the final version that i played in the deck so it's very consistent with what you'll see in the description of this video and what's being played right one card doesn't really change anything jackals are really good here because they have the horde five now with our leader so V2 boost self by three if we have horde five and that's very easy to get so these are like probably one of the best spenders if not the best spender in the game at that rate so they play really well with this leader ability which is why i couldn't sacrifice any of them and um you know just have to have it here past four peach talked about it talked about it and just basically talked about it that's uh the deck for you guys today and i included four games these games were back to back like i had a really good time playing the deck i'd like to do some more play testing this is something that i'm going to play maybe in my time off but uh for now i'll just release it so you guys can give it a try i definitely think we're there as far as optimization i just think it's unfortunate because i like the mages a lot and i like sly seductresses a lot but I don't like taking two of these out to put two of these in for the blind eye tags. And I don't love taking one of them out to put one of them in. So this is where I'm torn. And after seeing how good Gellert was with the Disciples, I don't want to take this out to make room for these. And with the Sewer Raiders, once I take out Thinning, then we don't pull our cards. So it's one of those things. I thought about taking out Thinning putting in one of these and putting in excommunication that's something you can maybe try but um honestly i think this is as good as it's going to get there's a reason why there's a provision limit because otherwise the deck's just going to be too good right so this is uh the closest i have to perfect in my opinion and uh we'll get into the games if you guys enjoy the video don't forget to sub to the channel i upload every single day at 8 a.m this one's a little bit late a few minutes late but uh <laughs> I don't know if you guys will notice. We'll see you soon. Take it easy. And we have post-game commentary for this one. All right. So for the first game here, we got Congregate Syndicate. And we've been seeing a lot of this since the new patch, of course, right? Firesworn with the major rework. So we have to be able to play in this swarm quite well. We'll see a lot of Deadeye Ambush as well, I'm sure, when we play this deck. So we do have some good control tools here as well. I don't know how much I value the poisons in this matchup because the only thing I can anticipate going really tall would be like a Fallen Knight and they have Veil, so that's where it gets a little bit difficult. But it is what it is. Disciples are just so good right now and I was inspired with the rework to the Disciple to put in the um, the Geller as well and then just have the four points per turn going off for only two coins per turn, right? Now fortunately they gave us a pretty good poison target so I'm going to take advantage of that. I just want to put down maybe one of the Peaches now because obviously getting that extra point per turn is kind of important. We don't lose the adrenaline on the uh the gellert so it it's it kind of just works out and if you didn't watch the intro one of the reasons why i didn't put sol is because i felt like it was too greedy in the meta right now for kind of what we're dealing with right a lot of I'm sure there's tall punish going around, no problem, so I felt like it wasn't overly necessary. We get a really good Philippa there on the Fallen Knight. Not only do we get to 
take that one, we actually get to engine it ourselves and we get to prevent the carryover from them. So Philippa just does really well. Now at this point of the round, it's kind of looking like maybe we don't need to use the Gallert here. We can maybe use it later, but um, the option's still available, right? I figure it might just be enough if we uh, if we just poison that out. Yeah, it's pretty good round control, so we don't have to go and spend another gold card here. We get the Intimidate boost off the Fallen Knight as well, so it synergizes really well with our deck. Now, I was experimenting with the Bronze End. Like, you'll see this version has the Bloody Good Friends, or Bloody Good Fun, rather. Um, the most recent version has the Apothecary, just for the extra Blind Eye tag. I'm, I'm actually confident with both. I think that it's pretty lean on the Blind Eyes that we're playing from hand. So if you're looking to be safer with it, go with the version with the Apothecary. But if you're finding that, you know, you're disciplined with the Mulligans, then that, that's okay. Um, the Bloody Good is actually pretty nice because uh, we can just get rid of Horde and have like another Tall Punish potentially, right? So it plays quite well. Now, they just went Fallen Knight full leader. So couple things here I'm thinking that if I go and spend yeah something like that even we get uh, some of the tribute knocked down for the uh, there we go boat comes out but we get the tribute knocked down for the king of beggars right MK down as well so you know I'm pretty comfortable with pushing a little bit here if we're going to use, like, the um, the Gellert play, now would be the time, just because we have four units on the board, and we can boost them all the same turn, right? With the Adrenaline, and then that's kind of like a big swing, so maybe it would provoke them to spend something kind of big while giving us room to get out of the round. So I think it's a good bleeding tool. And that's kind of the way I like to use Gellert, is just, like, establish a bit of a board state, then use them. Because even if they remove them, we've still gotten maybe like 8 or 10 boosts off them, so it it kind of pays well. Okay, so seeing that whole combo come out, we know what it's going to be, right? And we know that the longer we play into it, the worse it's going to get. Right here, they're probably going to have a really big turn. They can just use the Insanity even. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually quite fine with those trades. I think it's fair. We got a bit of a thin out of the way, a bit of a carryover by counting down the keg of beggars, and then we just really spend Gellert to do it. So it's pretty good. Cobb in hand, sure. So we missed a couple things, right? <clears throat> And this is kind of like one of the games where I'm thinking, okay, maybe we ought to take that out and put the extra blind eye, right? Because it's important to have a scenario that works. So easy enough. We take out the Fallen Knight, get the extra coin, spend on that. We're pretty good. It's one of those things, though, we have to kind of decide where things are going, right? Is it going to be passive flora? Is it too much of a risk? Like, now is a bit better time. We'll get the boat out first. Let me know in the comments if you hear the cab meowing. I let her out, she meows to get in, I let her in, she meows to get out, like, I just, I don't even know. So we'll get rid of that engine. 
and dive here. That's not bad. You know, we, we actually keep a fair amount of coins here so we could start engineering that. I think passive lore is still worth it just because we're going to be getting the double proc. So, like, we'll be getting the coins back from it as well, right? Which could be important later on. Yeah, I gotta let this cat out again. Give me a sec. I'll keep it going. Problem solved. Imagine having Adriano the Mink though. We like it just it's so many points that we lost. But uh, if we still win the game, it's a testament to how like good the deck can be overall, right? Missing Adriano missing Marils. That'll put us right back up to nine coins, right? Because we get the extra two. Yep. I was thinking about it, but... I think we can wait on removing those tokens. I want them to at least play for like three. Now... When you're in a situation like this, you want to make sure maybe to uh, not take out any tokens on the back row because they only have the one spender, right? I'm deciding to remove these tokens here just because um, we know that they're going to use their payoff card shortly, right? So they're going to be playing for four per turn essentially because or four per each because they have the Desiree and they have the Sacred Flame. So right now at two, it's it's not a big deal. And we'll click this because we want to get the value from it, right? This is one of the reasons why I don't run this card in my deck. Procession's just kind of like a target, right? It's inexpensive, but it's a really good poison value. Especially when they boost it twice, it'll be 14 on removal. Now, I do think they should have taken out maybe the Disciple, because we had the Spenders either way. Like, we had Jock there too, right? But uh, I don't think it would have given them the game. Like, we saw the double... Figured, why? Why bother? We'll just leave it. If we spend our coins there, then we're losing horde value. So they take the heat wave. And even then, it's enough, right? We can just basically go and play the jackal, not even have to click it, or not even have to play at this point. But a uh, couple takeaways from the, the game so far. Um, deck runs pretty smooth. I feel pretty comfortable playing it. The reduced hordes really help with cards like the... Sea Jackal with the Passiflora Peaches and whatnot. Obviously, having one more Blind Eye would be fine. But uh, overall, I think it's like really in that sweet spot. And uh, this is why I made the change because uh, it just 
it felt pretty smooth, but it just needed that like one card change. And I think Devotion's worth it with this deck. Just because the ability to wipe out Swarm with the Junior is like second to none. I don't think Tin Boy is going to be as good in Horde, just because uh, we want to hoard our coins a lot of the time. And uh, spending the Tribute of 7, well, that's on Reduced, isn't it? No, 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 they, they lowered it to 7, but still. Wait, no, it's 7 on Reduced. Yeah, it's spending 8 in this case would be expensive, so didn't want to go there. But uh, this right here is my exact Skellige Blaze of Glory deck that I uploaded yesterday. Maybe an hour after I uploaded the video, I went on ladder and I was looking at this one. It was card for card the same deck, so it was pretty exciting. Good game if this is you. And I have to be honest here, I was a little bit worried. I didn't think that we had the means to stop this deck. Coming into it, it's going to be a tough match. So, I opt to get rid of that here because I want to put on a little bit of pressure. I know that the problem with Skellige Warriors, especially, in round one is the tempo when the cards aren't as great, right? When they don't have the veteran status, like proccing. But... Obviously, King Bran has helped with that quite a bit. And, you know, I still feel very comfortable playing it. I just know that we can push a little bit and maybe make some inexpensive trades with uh, some of our bronzes here. So that's what I'm trying to do. We'll just keep jamming down engines at this point. Gutting Slash out of the way, so I'm feeling kind of confident that the Peach might stick at this point here. And these hunters are alternating. So the peach will just kind of like hang on unless they have a primal savagery in hand. So far we're doing all right. The bleeding is like one of those things though that really gets you over time. Like the bleeding, the pings, the boat, like it's just, uh, it's a mess. And we can't do anything about the second boat here. I'm just kind of waiting for them to stack that row. So I can see three. So we can get a pretty good trade on the... Uh, the mage, right? That's something. Preferably we want ranged so that we don't have to hit the armor. We want to click leader just in case they pass, right? And uh, I don't run Morkvarg in my most recent deck, so I'm depending on them not having it either. And that's like a really good take on the back row here. Good. Now... The problem about Blaze of Glory is that we want to be able to pass on them here, obviously to get card advantage going into round three, but I don't think the card advantage is very important because if Iced is still available, then they just have so many points in such a short round. So I feel like it's one of those things where we have to play and um, we got to play till we see what we want to see, right? So this is what I'm doing here. It 
it's worth it. If I can roll a Philippa or a Junior. And it looks super one-sided, but it's not, right? Like, I know that they could put down exactly. Like, this is kind of what we want to see, right? Obviously, Herald is another thing we want to see. Fakush is another thing we want to see, but... This whole iced play is just so many points. And that's in round two value too. Imagine round three. I think we still click to put the pressure on here. And there's an argument. Okay, we got that out of the way. That's kind of nice. I'm thinking last card's Herald or Fakusha, so I'm willing to trade Adriano. That's the idea. But I know that by doing that, I risk ruining my Passiflora. But at this time, I think it's the play to make, which is really, you know, daring, but it could just be a crappy card too. Actually, it's the Blood Eagle, yeah? Either way. Now it's just who top decks better, essentially, and I think leaving it to that chance is a little bit better than letting them pull exactly what they need in, like, their control-heavy deck, right? We still have tons of good stuff left for short round, like Jacques and short round's really good. Cobb obviously needs to go back, Passiflora. So, yeah. You see in the trend here, like, this is... I think after this game is when I made the change to the, uh, the bloody. So... We gotta play non-interactive, which is, uh, funny, but let's just get it done. Now, remember the... That's perfect. Remember the, um... The counter on the cob is gonna be at two. And Jacques has a tribute of four. Right? And that'll just be my stunning blow. So, because of that, we got it. And they missed Fukusha, but we literally had a dead scenario. So, I would say it's pretty even there as far as top decking, right? Now, how do we deal with something like this? This is after I made the change. You see the bottom right corner? It's not bad. Tribute 2, so it also has a tribute backup. And it's a blind eye, so a couple things. We know right away it's going to be clogged. It's going to be a tough game here. Drawing cards is already a difficult, like, it's not a difficult task, but it's Something we have to be disciplined with whenever we play Syndicate. I find it's a little bit more difficult than, let's say, other factions for drawing cards, but when we have Clog, it's just another whole story, right? I suppose that's fine. We just gotta get engine dominance out there, so getting as many as possible, right? Pete just goes down. And I thought about using, like, Sly Seductress in this deck. Because the previous version that I had was, like, non-devotion, had Mushy Truffle, had a couple Slies, like... And that was kind of an idea, it's just playing, like, a big Sly Swarm. That is something different, right? So, I'm not saying this is better than that, I'm saying that this is just different than that, so... It's just I did that. I wanted to try something new. We focus on the cards that saw some reworks and buffs, and it just so happens. Pretty good value here on the Apothecary, right? We're healing it, and then we're boosting it. So it's doing six for two coin. Like a boost.
It doesn't have to be that card, it's just I wanted to fit like a 4 provision. Like you could put beggars if you want, but I find that getting coin is not really a problem. Now, they're stuffing us with blind eyes, so we don't have to worry as much about getting our blind eyes for scenario, so I'm keeping that one in mind, right? Which is kind of like more of a reason to want to use this here, because it, it trades pretty well. Like, look at... Little extra tribute, little extra that, yeah. It's huge. We're still in it though. You know, we kind of have to play. We don't have to click, but we might as well click because they're going to be pushing it. And I would expect them to use leader if they're, you know, in doubt, right? Here would be a good time because they have their sunset right most. It's just like, with the tempo that they have coming at this point, how do you even compete with that? You know, Jacques in hand is great for late game, but it's really bad for round one, so we have to be careful with that. Morils here is kind of like something we don't want to spend, because if it is Colgrim, we have to deal with that. Playing a poison, I don't mind, because they have no idea, right? We can bluff the poison, maybe get the pass and play something else to take the win. That's kind of the idea. Like, get the boat out and all. That we just need to find 10 points. Sunset coming down. You see, we can hold in there for that one extra turn. That's kind of what matters. These are huge plays that we just wouldn't be able to compete with later, right? The 14 plus the 9. And then the sunset right when they drew. So you can imagine just like a really nasty top deck from here on out, like frustrating. And that's basically the reason why I don't enjoy this archetype because I like to play matches where it's just, you know, we both draw the cards by the means that we've put in our deck to be able to draw them and then whoever plays better wins kind of thing this kind of goes against it when you play Colgrim there's really not much we can do here right we have to just play this because we have to get ahead I opt to not take the tribute because realistically it doesn't make a huge difference we kind of want to keep our coins Now, I'm worried about, obviously, like, we can get through a defender, but we can't get through a Colgrim as easily, like, unless they don't stuff the deck again, because we have 13, they have 5, so this 8 card difference, Horson could do 9 on one turn, so, you know, obviously... If they keep drawing things to clog, we're in trouble, but other than that, we should be alright. Another poison would help too. So we did draw in a scenario. And... We definitely need another blind eye here. The only reason why I don't think we got our blind eyes in this game is because of the clog. I don't think it has to do with anything else. Okay. 
So we just have free coins sitting there when we need it. Yeah, like 12 cards in deck round three. It's just kind of a bad feeling. Now we do have the tribute for the King of Beggars in hand. We've got the Jacques with the four and the Marils with the six, right? So King of Beggars will thin back out. Problem is like I'm starting to regret having clicked the leader. So like right here I'm just cutting losses basically. I'm saying, alright, like I can't manage my hand that way. Like we just have to we just have to play the damn card and uh you know spend accordingly this next turn and then deal with it that way. So, King of Beggars comes out shortly, so we don't have to worry too much about about our, the way we could spend coins. I know that if they're Reants, they're usually not double Colgrim, so I'm starting to see the light here. It would be the most points if we play the Peach. Like, again, it's one of those things where we do over-profit from the, the actual scenario, but it's probably just better that we get the Peach down there. I don't think they have the points to get back into it. We just take out the Defender, Cough comes out, then we can fix our coin situation, right? There we go. And so it's a blight maker. So we just win the game. It was a really frustrating one to play, of course, but we got it done. Even coins left, even card left. So it didn't really matter about everything else, right? Moving on to the last game. This is going to be Ursine Ritual Self Wound. With the second version of the deck. Pulling into Cobb's okay, I guess. Mulligan it back later. Times like this, you wish you had a Coxteen because, like, being able to just purify and demand around that would be kind of nice. It's really a provisions thing, though. So we should try and click to get the boat out at this point because we want to look for a pass if necessary. 
I don't want to play too deep into the round if it means like giving them a lot of carryover. Like a temple pass would be kind of nice so they can't bleed round two. We do have another turn or two left, though, I think. There we go. I think it's still worth it because we want to get that engine down, get the tribute taken. It's not ideal once defenders come into play, but that card works really well against like a Saskia play. It's 20 to 35. To me, that seems like a pretty good time to pass because we also get the extra point on the peach, right? I didn't think that they had any card on their deck right now that could do it in one. There is obviously one card that I forgot about. Yeah, there you go. So they managed to pull it off with a five provision card. Just wild. And when someone fights that hard to get it in one turn, it tells me that they might try and push. You see them looking at the play here, so I know it's something's gonna happen. The protects you from all yep. We could just remove it, right? Like, it's not a bad take with the junior. But at the same time, we have the card advantage, right? So I'm thinking basically, okay, there's no way that they have any other like resurrections because They've spent Sigdrivas, they've spent the Fakusha, and I don't anticipate them having a Bride of the Sea. That's the only other thing that like, I would say would be able to bring it back. Build Carl coming down. They're just really pushing it. So I go ahead and I take this here thinking that's just fine, right? We got to kind of get some points on the board. Take some points off their board. Now 
And that's kind of like what I wasn't expecting, right? So them being able to take Alyssa and then put Sigdrif is right back in the deck. It's kind of wild. We just have to take it here. It's kind of a bad spot. Even though we over profit the one. I want to get full coin just in case there's something we want to take. Philippa would be good for that. Realistically, though, in this matchup, you kind of want to try and take that Sig Vault, so that's something that I'm trying to get ready for. The only thing I can think of at this point that's going to get us out of the round is if we can bring down that bear to like 9 and take it, right? Or kill it off. I clicked this because I'm tired of wasting coins. It's like not an ideal hand at all, so... And it's like they knew exactly when to play the card. Now we can't afford it. If I was to do this again, I probably would poison the Sigvald for that reason alone. It's just hard to predict if they have like Marjoram's in hand, right? So. But it really comes down to it. I think that they're, yeah. So they're just going to greed that. And that's kind of the mistake. We just take this right away. Destroy an allied healed self. Take the boat out. But really, what would have stopped that for us is let's say there was of one poison already on the sig vault and then we can just go into you know our vivaldi bank and grab another poison we would be fine it's got to be jacques here so we'll survive it extra coin back here spend accordingly right I'm not pleased with the way the round went but um I'm just glad we made it out the deck snuff into uh, look past it's a pretty strong deck we still have scenario which is great we've got the one blind eye here we've got that I should have just kept it.
But what I'll do is like, um, if there's any changes between now and when I post the deck, like, as far as blind eyes go, I'll just like add them so that the deck you guys see has like, uh, like the balance. If anything, probably just like one more apothecary and take out like, some bronze card you know what i mean but uh i can look at that or maybe take out one of the mages and put in like a sly or something it shouldn't be that tough of a, a change like and that's just nitpicking it at this point like it's still winning games the way it is like i'm showing you guys the games that i played so it was a little bit of a streak right And we just get it there. We'll see you guys tomorrow with another one.